Bethel City Church today. Praise the Lord. All right, so if, if you can see my computer screen or my TV screen, <clears throat> have you ever seen a, uh, a computer code? That's actually a program that's kind of an artistic rendering of a computer program code. But if you get down to the very basics of computer programming and very basics of computers working, just like on our little uh, credit cards, debit cards, that little chip there holds enormous amounts of power, you know, of information. But it all comes back down to thousands of pages of, of literally zeros or ones. That's all that's in a code, a program code, zeros or ones. Thousands of pages of zeros or ones. The zero stands for no charge, and the one stands for charge. So it's all based on electric. That's why a computer has to have some kind of power, battery, or, or AC. But uh, uh, <clears throat> every, everything that the computer does or that the computer tells another machine to do is based on pulse or no pulse. Send a, send a, a charge or no charge. And that will control a machine. It's really, it's really phenomenal. I actually worked in a computer programming company for a while. I'm not a programmer. I was a salesman. But I would actually go out in the field, and, and we had a, a debit card system and a chip card system, and I would go out in the field and sell it and use it, but I would also have to troubleshoot. And so I would, I would oh, they'd call me up. This isn't working. So I'd go get it. I'd go get the little board the little uh, reader, the whatever the smart board was, the motherboard, and in the machines we were using, they were pretty small. And I'd take them back to the computer programmer. He'd hook it up in his computer. He'd say, oh, I see what the problem is. And he'd go to the right, at the right line of code and either change some ones or some zeros. He'd reprogram it, and out it would go. It, it, really, was, it really was phenomenal. These, these, and these guys that, com, that, that program these computers, they're, they're not like people, they're more like a machine, but they think in that term, they think in, in terms of that. So anyway, I said all that to say, not to bore you, but I said all that to say computer programming is an exact science. I mean, it's exact. You have to have every zero in the right place on every line. You have to have every one in the right place. I'm making a point, so uh, it, it's gonna mean something. You have to have uh, one in the right place. Every single line, every single digit has to be exactly right. That's what an exact science means. And if something is missing or wrong or in the wrong place, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. It malfunctions. That's actually what a, a virus is. So computer programming is an exact science. This is a little something we use more often. The internet is also an exact science. Uh, search engines do this for you, but back before there was a lot of search engines, uh, you would have to type in the exact address of the web page you wanted to go to. You couldn't type it in different. You couldn't add a, a number or miss a letter or whatever. It had to be exact. Email is the exact same way. We send emails all the time. Well, you have to send it exactly to the address. If my email is, um, uh, you know, Rick is amazing at gmail.com, maybe, yeah, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll get that one, and you send it to dummyrick at gmail.com, hopefully it's not going to find me. That would be very, pretty rough if, oh, we knew who that guy is. You know, we'll send it to him. We know where that's supposed to go. But it has to be exactly right. You can't, it's an exact science. It can't be one letter, one digit, one symbol out of place. It won't work. It'll come back to you undeliverable. Won't work. A computer program won't work. The internet email will not work unless it's exact. Well, I said all that to tell you, listen, faith, the Bible says, is an exact science. It's not just some pie in the sky, oh, I believe. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living by faith. The Bible says four times the just shall live by faith, and I'm submitting to you today that it is an exact science. And since it's an exact science, two things. One, it's no respecter of persons. You don't have a better chance at faith than I do or a better advantage than I do. I don't care what your position is. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what your education level is. It doesn't matter. 
Faith is an exact science, and as an exact science, it works for whosoever will work it. See, that internet address works for whosoever will type it in exactly right. It doesn't matter who you are as a person. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. It works. That's how exact science works. It works exactly the same for you and you and you and you and you and me. It works exactly the same for all of us. Hence, you see in the Bible, God is no respecter of persons. It works exactly the same for all of us. So if I find something that works, guess what? It's going to work for you too. Because it works exactly the same. There's no respecter of persons. That's what exact science means. The computer program doesn't care what your good intentions are. It only knows what the code says. The internet address doesn't care where you wanted to go. It only knows what you put into it. And that's all it deals with. And I'm submitting to you that faith is exactly the same way. It's not up to our goodness, our personality, our intelligence, our willpower, our strength, our gifts, our talents. I'm submitting to you that faith works exactly the same for anyone who will work it. If we work the system exactly right, or if we're not. So in that sense, since it's exact science then, uh, the definition of exact science is something like this. It requires faith, is an exact science, faith is no respecter of persons, and faith requires, this is important, absolute precision. Absolute. You can't have one bit of code out of place. It requires absolute precision. You stop using faith for one second and you will sink like a stone. Absolute. You get your eyes off Jesus for one second and to the bottom you go. But wait, Jesus, I love you. You're going down. Peter loved Jesus, didn't he? He loved Jesus. He, was, he forsook all. He even said that. Jesus, we've forsaken all to follow you. Got his eyes off Jesus for one second. If Jesus is not standing right next to him within arm's length, he's a goner, you know. He's at the bottom. Jesus had to have to raise him up. <laughs> Get your eyes on the wind and the wave for one second and you'll drop like a rock. The Bible says the just shall live by this exact science of faith. The just will live by learning or not learning how to use faith with absolute precision. I'm glad you love Jesus. I'm glad you worship him. I'm glad you follow him. I'm glad if you have forsaken things for him. Jesus said rejoice for that. I'm glad you're committed to Jesus. I'm glad. But your life is according to your faith. That's what the guy you follow, that's what he said. <laughs> All the disciples, look at that, right? All the disciples loved Jesus. But they really were kind of just, you know, and I say this kindly, uh, and, you know, I might have to stand before them one day, but, uh, you know, they appeared to be a bunch of clowns before they got a hold of faith. Isn't that what Jesus said to them? O oh, ye of little faith, where's your faith? Why are you doubting? Just constantly. He wasn't doubting their sincerity. He wasn't doubting their commitment to him. He was saying, where's your faith? 
But then you can look at those same guys. And in the book of Acts, they became world beaters. They finally learned how to use faith. And the Bible says there is nothing impossible to the person that learns how to use faith exactly right. Our whole life is according to this faith. All right. There's a changer here somewhere. I always forget. All right. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 9, 29, then he touched their eyes. We're talking about two blind men that came to Jesus. Blindness. This is like an incurable thing. This is blindness from 2,000 years ago. This is, you know, there was no doctors. There was no help in this area for these guys. They were incurable. They were without hope. And he touched their eyes. And he said, because of your faith, it will happen. And King James Version says, according to your faith, be it unto you. He's talking about blindness. You talk, you talk about some wild stuff. Here's Jesus. You remember when he said that it, unless you come to me as a little child, unless you have faith like one of these little children, unless you just accept my word, you're not going to know how to walk with me. So when Jesus says, it's according to your faith, and he was telling blind people that. That, that astounds me. It's according to your faith. What happens from here on is based on your faith. You made it here? Wonderful. Forget it. Forget the past. From here on, it's according to your faith. I said, we believe. He said, well, according to your faith, be it unto you. And if faith is an exact science, listen now, if faith is an exact science, then it was according to how you use this exact science. Are you using it with absolute precision? They must have, because they were healed. They received according to your faith. Now, a lot of times we can't, we can't um, look for support from our Christian friends. They mean well. But anybody who doesn't know how to use faith does not have a clue what you're talking about. So, a lot of times the disciples, you know, they were kind of, they were kind of a hindrance to Jesus. And he's like, how long am I going to put up with you guys, you know? <laughs> They'd say stuff like, and we looked at that last week, send her away, she's bothering us. They were doing that for Jesus, you know, in his name. Jesus, why are you talking to them, the Samaritans? We have no dealings with them. Uh, hey, Jesus, would you like me to call fire down on these people and kill them for you? We want to know... Which one of us is the greatest? This is the kind of thing that was on their minds. <laughs> they were not people of faith, even to the point of, you know, the, the pinnacle of, of Peter. He goes in one night, cuts a guy's ear off protecting Jesus. A few hours later, denies he even knows the guy three times to somebody that couldn't have heard him. Then they learned faith. And the Bible says they turned the world upside down. Because Jesus said your whole life, he said it to them there, your whole life is according to your faith. That means, if that's true, if we just accept that, I can't even understand it all to tell you the truth. I just accept it because Jesus said it. So that means my life's not according to God. Of course God wants the best for me. He sent his own son for me to take my place so I could be with him. But Jesus didn't say, your life's according to what God has done for you. I can't help you had he didn't say that, but he didn't say it. 
He didn't say, your life is according to the devil and how powerful he is and strong he is and how much he harasses you. He didn't say, your life is according to other people. They've hurt you or misused you or abused you or taken advantage of you. He didn't say, life is, your life is according to this world and how dark it is and getting darker all the time. But he did say, According to your what? Faith. Faith. That's, that's how you're going to have it in this life. As a matter of fact, that's how you have it right now. According to your ability, understanding, to learn how to use faith on purpose as an exact science with absolute precision, that's how your life is. Your life is determined. See, it's not determined by the giants. We all have giants. It's determined by how I look at those giants. This is what he's saying. According to you. It's according to you. So if it's true, if Jesus told the truth, and my life is according to an exact science that must be used with absolute perfection, precision, don't you think it'd be wise to learn how to use it? Right? Let's learn how to use it. If this is such a scientific thing, if it 2 plus 2 is 4 and nothing else, if it's so scientific, then we can learn how to use it. There's no respecter of persons. Anybody can learn it. And it seemed to me if Jesus ever met somebody that wasn't capable of faith, he'd heal them so they were capable of faith. That'd be nice. And if you look at Jesus, we mentioned it last week, he walked in great faith and, of course, great power. And if you look at his life, you'll see that there was natural provision for him. Many times people supported him, gave to him. Susanna, Joanna, and many other women supported his ministry. But then there were times where it was just supernatural provision. He's out in the middle of nowhere and needed 15,000 lunches. Joanna and Susanna couldn't run save him. He wasn't limited to that. 15,000 lunches. And if you remember, we read Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about, this is how he used his faith. And he went about healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That's what he used his great power for. And you'll see it throughout Scripture. For three plus years, that's what he did. That was his job, day job, you know. <laughs> so as far as you and I go, we can operate in this same faith. Great faith, great power. And I submit two things to you. Learn to richly enjoy your life. And learn to relieve the suffering of others. This is the purpose you're here on this earth. A lot of people only want the first one, but you have to have both. That's what Jesus did. That's how he used his faith. So last week, if you remember, we said the first part of faith... I just want to hit this before we jump to the second part. The first part of faith, faith only looks at what it wants. Mark eleven twenty two through 24. 24 says, whatsoever things you desire, want, ask for, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. This is Jesus talking. I didn't come up with this. Some get-rich-quick guru didn't come up with this. This is Jesus, Almighty God, saying this. You know, the world grabs a hold of principles like this, and all they can think about is getting money for, with it, you know, getting more stuff. Well, God doesn't mind us getting stuff as long as we use it, enjoy it, and help people with it. That's what he did. If you'll change your motive, God might give you more stuff. <laughs> Amen. 
Faith only looks at what it wants. It only looks at what it wants to see happen. I'm talking about using faith as an exact science. It has to be used exactly right with absolute uh, precision. And part one is you must, you can only look at, if you want to live by faith and use your faith, only look at what you desire to see. And certainly not look at what is happening now or has been happening. We look at what we want to see. We do not look at the nine-foot giant taunting us. Remember Psalm 23? He prepares a table for us, right? God prepares a feast table for us. Where is it at? In the presence of our enemies. So what are you looking at? There's two things to look at. They're both there. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm not saying the nine-foot giant's not there. What was the army looking at? The army were in their tents. He'd come out every day, every morning, every night and taunt them. (laughs) He was taunting God and the armies of God. And David, he was probably a young man at the time. We've already been told he's a little boy, but I think he was about a young man at the time because he really you know, just started being a leader of men. He looked at the exact same giant that everybody else was looking at. And he said, I'll cut your head off this day. And I'll feed it to the birds of the air. And a taunting giant. (laughs) Until he took his last breath, right? (laughs) According to your faith, be it unto you. Are we sitting down, enjoying the feast? Or are we under the table, whining and crying and moaning because we're surrounded by enemies? What are you looking at? What are you seeing with faith? Because faith requires absolute precision 100% of the time. You could be enjoying that feast wonderfully and get your eye off the feast and get it on one of those enemies and you'd be right under the table in one second. Oh no! Don't we do that? Don't we have that ability as human beings? Just in a second. He's taunting me. That storm's beating upon me. The wind and the wave is pulling me under. I have this incurable condition, a mountain of debt. I see decline in the churches. I confessed my sin last week about that. You know what I've learned to do? Sorry, giants. Can't look at you today. I know you would like my attention. I know you would feed off of my fear and terror my focus on you, but I'm too busy. I'm too busy looking at this wonderful feast. (laughs) I'm too busy. Faith is looking at what I want. I don't have time for that. I'm too busy looking at what I want. You start looking away, it'll sink like a stone. Remember last week we told we told the story, we ended with that story about the Canaanite woman. Remember her? She came to Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on me. My, my daughter is possessed with a devil who controls her and she's suffering. A parent, seeing her, their child suffer and heard about Jesus. Jesus, help me. And you know what the Bible says? He answered her not one word. Well, that in itself could get a person that doesn't have faith, that could get their eye off what they want, right? Oh, God didn't answer. But she didn't get her eye off. The Bible says she implored him again, have mercy on me. And that's when the disciple says, send her away. 
Her begging is bothering us. I'm telling you, Christians don't know anything about what we're talking about today. How to live by faith. Christians get bothered by people of faith. Send her away. And they liked it that Jesus wasn't answering her. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want her. And then she just keeps at it. She, does, she doesn't move. This lady doesn't move. And then Jesus said this, it's not right. Oh, well, first he said, I wasn't sent except to the house of Israel. But the Bible says she didn't even like hear that. He, she just kept at it. She pleaded with him again. And then he got a little stronger. He said, it's not right to give the children's bread unto dogs. And even that, even that didn't de defer her. Now, Nina and I were talking. She had read an a article a while back that Canaan, in the land of Canaan, and the Canaanites, along with Egypt, they had idols, and one of their idols had a dog head, literally had a dog head with a tail. They, you can look it up on the internet. You can see this, what, it, what they believe it looked like or from old, uh, you know, hieroglyphic writings or whatever. So this, so basically this, he could have been saying this. He could have said, it's not right to give children's bread to people who believe in God to someone who worships dogs, who believes that a dog is God. And what'd she say? I'm not changing. That's right. I'm not, I'm not I, I don't care what you say. I'm not moving. I'm not changing. I'm only looking at what I want. And Jesus said, oh woman. I mean, stopped him in his tracks. Great is your faith. I'm telling you this faith stuff, it's no respecter of persons, right? It works for dog worshipers. We might have a lot of them in the earth today. People love their animals, you know, which is fine. We were kind of talking about that. Don't put anything above God. But they were. They, were, they would worship dogs. And it worked for her. Amen. If it'll work for a dog worshiper, surely it worship, it'll work for me, you know. She gives me hope. <laughs> what are you looking at? Are you looking at what you want? Or are you looking at the disciples trying to keep you away? Or are you looking at your position? Yeah, I'm an unworthy dog worshiper. What are you looking at? Now, we said last week we'll, we'll hit it again because it's very important. Our desires need to be in agreement with God's desires. This is not hard to do. Get in agreement with what God says. All you got to do is read the book. If you want to know what God's desires are, read the book. They're in that book. And if it doesn't line up with that book, throw it out. So our desires, when I'm saying keep your focus your, your eyes on your desires, what you want, it's based on our desire coming in agreement with God's. James 4.2, he, he heard Jesus that day teach Mark 11, you know, what, uh, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. Well, he heard it, and this is what he got out of it. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want, want what will give you pleasure or to consume it, King James says, upon our own lust. Basically, to lay up more treasure in heaven. That's everybody's goal. Oh, I'll, just, I'll be safe if I lay up more treasure for me. No. The kingdom of God is enjoy richly what God has given you and help others. Relieve the suffering of others. So if you get in agreement with that, John said it this way. He was also there that day. Jesus taught Mark 11. Uh, 1 John 5, 14. And we're confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that, uh, pleases, that pleases him. Uh, King James says, according to his will. 
And since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he will give us whatever we have for, uh, ask for. We also know that we have, King James says, those petitions. So the first part of faith, Jesus used faith. He had great power and great faith because his desires were in agreement with God's desires. So the first part of faith, faith only looks at what it wants, whatsoever things you desire, only looks at what it wants. And then here's the second part. Listen, this was just as important because it's an exact science. This may even be more important, but I, I can't decide which is, which is more. You know, you can't say, well, the zero is more important than the one. No, you, you need them both in computer programming. The second part of faith, if you want to learn to use it, first, only look at what you want. And the second part of faith, only talk about what you want. Now, I'm going to give you some extras you can talk about. You can use your words for praise. You can use your words for thanksgiving. You can use them for love, for mercy, for kindness, for interacting with human beings as a kind, gentle, loving, merciful person. And you can use your words for what you want and nothing else. Listen to this. The Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You step out of faith one second, you drop like a stone. Why? It's sin. To use our words for something else. Words were given to us to only say what we want to see happen. What we desire to see in agreement with God's desires. You get that. And nothing else. Stop talking. This will change your life. If you learn to do this, this will change your life. Literally will change your life. Stop talking about what is happening. It'll change your life. A lot of us would be a lot better off to just not say anything for a while. If I don't want something to keep happening, if I don't want to keep, see it keep going, continuing, don't talk about it. How about the spies? Ten spies and two spies, Joshua and Caleb and the other ten. They saw the exact same thing. Two of them entered the promised land. It took them 40 years. Ten of them never did. And neither did that whole generation. And guess what they were saying? There are giants in the land. And in our eyes... We are as grasshoppers to them. And so they saw us as grasshoppers too. And guess what? Here's the news. Exact science. It's not changing. It's not changing. You want to keep using your words for what is and what's happening? I'm not saying it's not real. Those giants were real. You go against them without faith and they'll cut your head off. But there were two other guys. And what did they say? Yeah, there's giants. But man, I'm telling you, this land is flowing with milk and honey. And they are bread for us. That's what they said. They saw the exact same guys. What are you talking about? What are you using your words for? This is exact science, folks. It has to be done right. We're well able. Let us go up at once. 
That's what they said. If you want to know the power of words, look at, we won't look there today, look at James chapter 3. He talks about the power of words. He says it's like a bridle in a horse's mouth. You can make that giant horse do anything you want with that bridle. He said that's the way, that's a, a tongue is to life. He said it's like a, a huge ship with a little rudder in the back. And the guy in charge of the rudder can make that ship. He said, doesn't matter what the winds are doing, the guy in charge of that rudder can make that ship go wherever he wants it to go. And he says, your tongue is like that. Your words are that powerful. He said, it's, your tongue is like a little spark that, that, that looks insignificant. Oh, my words aren't stout against me. God said that in Malachi 3. Your words are stout against me, he told Israel. Oh, my words aren't important. And, and James says, that little spark can burn down a whole forest. That's how powerful what we choose to say is. Since words are so powerful, only use them for what you want to see happen. If you don't want to see it, or see it continue, do not talk about it. Don't use this great power for that. And this second part of faith must be used with absolute precision. You talk about the giants one day and land flowing with milk and honey another, it's not going to work. Absolute precision. So Mark 11. This is where we started last week. Mark 11:22, King James Version. Jesus is talking to his disciples specifically. Have faith in God. He's going to tell us the exact science of faith. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Not, one, not for one second. You can't stop looking at what you want for one second. You can't stop talking about it for one second. You must set your face like a flint. <laughs> like the... Like the Canaanite woman. Have you been using that yes. phrase? Yes. <laughs> and shall not doubt in his heart, but be shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. Three times Jesus says, what you say, what you say, what you say. One time, what you believe. Three times, what you say. No doubt. Not one second, not one zero out of place, not one character out of place in that email address. No variation. <clears throat> James says it this way about no, or, uh, about no doubt. James says, uh, James 1, 6, King James Version, but let him ask in faith. The context is wisdom, but it, as you'll see, it works for everything. Uh, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man, I'm not supposed to let you even think, let that, that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable. This isn't just for faith. In all your ways. This covers all of life. So I'm supposed to stand up here and how much I love you, I love you guys. I really appreciate you coming. I, I do. I, I love you guys. I love all the people that listen to, to us. But I'm supposed to, when you come, I'm supposed to tell you that you'll receive nothing from the Lord if you don't learn to live by faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith is not double-minded. 
It can't look at both. Look at both, we receive nothing. Peter looked at both. We're almost done. We're going to wind down with this uh, story. Peter looked at both one day. Matthew 14, 28, famous story. Jesus, then a storm, they're all like afraid they're going to die, and Jesus comes to them walking on the water. So let's pick up there. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, yeah. Isn't that a great response? Yeah. He didn't say, oh, Peter, you know you can't do that. This is just for me. He said, no. I want to show you and all those guys in the boat, I want to show you how powerful faith is. I want to show you what a human being can do with faith. No limits to a person of faith. If we learn to not waver, not doubt, every second focused on what we want, every second and every word used only for what we want, nothing's impossible to you. Look what faith can do. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Peter did. You know, all the stories when we heard growing up in children's church and stuff was Jesus walked on the water. Nobody ever said Peter walked on the water. They said Peter sank, but he actually did walk on the water. And what do you think happens if he starts looking at what is, he starts looking at what's actually happening around him. He starts looking, he uses his eyes to look at what's happening. If he does that, what do you think is going to happen to Peter? We all know the story, right? One second is all it took. One second. Look at this. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified. One second. And began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. He might have even... Yeah, I I think uh, the Chosen shows him uh, Jesus reaching under the water that Peter had already gone under. (laughs) Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. Why would you doubt me? And of course the rest of her says, you know, they, they said, oh, what great man Jesus is. And that wasn't the lesson at all. The lesson is, where's your faith? You get no warning, no buffer, no cushion, no coasting on yesterday's faith. You get one second and that's it. No five-minute grace period. One second. Take your eyes off what you want. Start looking at a giant or the storm or the waves or the enemies surrounding you. And they are ready to devour you instantly. They'll do it today. They'll do it tomorrow. And they'll do it for the rest of your life. Unless you decide, you know what? (laughs) I'm going to learn to do this. I'm going to learn to live this way. And here's the good news. I actually like that it's instant. Because you get an instant alert. You just stepped out of faith. You can feel it. There is an instant heaviness and terror that grips your heart. Instantly. When you get your eyes off of Jesus. When you get your eyes off of what you want. When you step out of faith. You can feel it instantly. Terror. Because listen, faith feels light. That's how you know you're in faith. You almost think you're kind of walking on water, you're floating on air. Faith feels light. That's how you know you're in faith. I came to church today in faith. I feel light. I look and I see every room I ever speak at is full. That's what I see. 
And when I believed that, every room Jesus went to was full. Well, I bring him with me where he goes. He said, I'll be in you. So there's no reason every room. I've seen every room. I've had many experiences where room has been full, lined up with people. So when you believe that, you come in light. When you believe what you see, you sink like a stone. Heaviness. Terror. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Peter said, when you believe, it's like living in joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's what faith is like. It's like walking on water. I mean, that's a thrill, you know. Just think how you'd feel if you actually walked on water a couple of steps. Whoa! You're telling everybody you know for the rest of your life. Quick, quick, get my phone. <laughs> Stop for one second. You'll feel it instantly. You'll know you're looking at the wrong thing and you're talking about the wrong thing and terror will seize your heart. Because this isn't about human strength. This is about faith. You're no match for all these enemies. You're no match for it. They're no match for faith. A giant. A giant's no match for a human being with faith. They can surround my table. I don't care. They're no match for me in faith. They will terrorize you until you change what you're looking at and change what you're saying. Situation don't have to change. May not ever change. We can't let up for one second. This is an exact science that must be used with absolute precision. Last one, thank you. When they climbed back in, when Peter and Jesus climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped and the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God. That had nothing to do with what he was trying to teach them that day. He's glad they believe. I'm glad you believe Jesus is the Son of God. But that's not what he was teaching that day. He was teaching them, if you will ever learn faith, if you'll ever get this, there's nothing impossible unto you. There are no limits to the person of faith. All right, so I got some homework. I want you this week, pick an area in your life, something that troubles you, you know. You can feel it, heaviness. Every time you think about it, you can tell, you can feel it. I want you to pick an area. We'll call that our personal giant or storm or mountain. Very daunting. Enemies surrounding us. Could be physical, could be material, could be relational, whatever it is. And I want you to use that area, pick a place, and I want you to, I know what mine is, I'm, I'm using mine on, I just told you, what I see when I speak. People want to go to heaven. So why not come to hear somebody that will help them get to heaven? That's where my faith is. Oh, they love it. <laughs> personal giant, personal storm, mountain. And I want you to apply this exact science of faith with absolute precision 100% of the time. You just keep practicing until you get it crazy to think you can walk in this without practice. I'd be like me thinking, well, I'm going to be an NBA basketball player, but I never take a shot. Makes no sense. I can't tell you how many shots I took just to become a starter on my high school team, going from the worst kid in ninth grade to starting on my high school basketball team. Guess how many shots were in between? I don't know. Hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe. I don't know. Practice. That's what I'm talking about. Practice. You can't be great at this unless you practice it. So next time it surfaces, might be 2 o'clock this morning, next time it surfaces, 
Oh, there you are. Taunting me, hounding me, tormenting me again. And usually what we do is look at it and talk about it till we're exhausted. And that's where we go for food or alcohol or drugs or, you know, relationships or whatever it is. Because we're, we're exhausted. We need some relief, some comfort. And I'm saying, take that same area and stop looking at what is happening. Stop talking about what is happening. Practice using faith. You know what? That situation is there, the giants are all around, but I'm going to look at what I want to happen. Amen. I'm going to look at what I want. And I'm only going to talk about what I want to see happen. From now on. Amen. And I'm going to practice it until I get it 100% right. Precision. And, and you'll know when you do, because lightness comes. His burden is easy and light. And I don't know how many people are walking in lightness right now. Jesus said, will I find faith when I return? Faith is an exact science. It only works when applied with absolute provision, precision. And our whole life is according to how we use this power. Have faith in God. For whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and never doubt, not for one second in their heart, but believes that those things which he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say unto you, whatever you desire, when you pray, Believe you receive it, and you will have it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's thank our uh, online audience for joining us today. Praise the Lord.